How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. It's Thursday on this show, and you know what that means. We've got AW Dynamite to talk about from last night. Lots of stuff happening on the show. We had wild cards. We had a build for next weekend's Memorial Day weekend pay-per-view, which I will be at live and uh, and more. Sasha Banks, Naomi, ratings. Yes, a lot to get into here today. And we will be joined... In the next segment of this show, by Mike Sempervivi. He is making his triumphant return here today. I can uh, tell you that Landstorm also feeling better, still not 100%. But uh, best wishes to everybody in the empire that has been recently afflicted. Including myself, actually, but I didn't test positive. I was just, I don't know what I had, but I was sick. But anyway, we're all back in the saddle, it's looking like. So uh, Mike will join us after the break. And uh, as noted, we'll talk about uh, everything we know, the latest on uh, Sasha and Naomi, which is not a lot. It's the same story from Monday, which kind of is a story in and of itself, actually. We've got an update on Ric Flair. Tony Storm talks about the angle where she had a pie thrown on her face. I'm sure you can figure out where this is going. We have NXT ratings from Tuesday night. Update on John Cena. And yes, we'll be talking about the AW... Dynamite show from last night. Maki Ito was a joker. Was she ever? And uh, Johnny Elite, who was uh, John Morrison, not Johnny Gargano. And we could tell you about that as well. So uh, a lot to get into here on the show today. If you want, Texas 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. At Brian Elvers on Twitter. Back in a moment. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com, is here today. I can't believe you're here, Mike. I mean, for a lot of reasons. But uh, there you are. I had the wrong channel on the whole time. You were probably Smooth. talking to me during the break, and I was ignoring you, huh? No, I actually didn't say a word, because okay. I know how you are during the break, which is you look away the entire time and pretend nobody else exists. No, I'm actually very busy. And, uh, dude, I can't believe you came back today. Why'd you even bother? You should have just taken the whole week off, dude. I thought about it after I heard you nail yourself to the cross talking about Naomi and Sasha. God, between these Sasha fans and these Maki Ito fans, I just can't. I, I can't take Brian do Alvarez. This. Here he goes. Here you go. Here we go. Go ahead. No, I want to know how you're doing. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. That's why I'm asking you. If I didn't care, I'd just move on. Are you better today? I'm much better today, actually. I actually feel like a human being uh, again. Felt like having the felt like having the flu, except I never had a temperature the entire time. Just the body aches, the chills, and the cough, which I know bore itself out last week on the show. That just continued. It felt like I was getting a little bit better. And then Friday came, and Jessica tested positive, and I tested positive, and I thought about, you know what? I shouldn't even test myself because I'm going to go to D.C. I'm going to see New Japan. I'm going to see Tanahashi. You did I'm the right see, thing testing yourself. I'm going to see my champion, my champion, still my champion, filthy Tom Lawler, defend. Well, he wasn't oh, defending God. on that don't, night, don't but it would have been this. his last He's not night. the champion right now. I, I have enough with Makito and Sasha. <sighs> I don't need you and Tom on top of everything else. But I did test myself and decided, no, I can't go anywhere. So and I'm happy I didn't because how I felt, I would have infected the entire DMV because I felt rotten and it just got worse. And so finally, I've been able to shake a little of it off. It feels just, you know, the breathing is not there. You know, just, you know, shallow breathing a little bit. Unfortunately, I can actually feel that. So hopefully that goes away as I get out and walk more and, you know, feel better. But, yeah, it sucks. And for anybody that had to go through it worse than me, which is a lot of people out there, boy, do I have my sympathies for you because this little bit was bad enough. You know what's funny about this? I guess it's not funny, but you know what's weird about this whole COVID thing is uh, my, my both of my daughters got uh, covid in uh, it was early January or something like that. I'm pretty sure my wife, too, but we didn't get a positive test on her. But we did on the kids. 
And uh, and man, Paisley had a, a runny nose for like a day, and then she was fine. And uh, Hanalei was was somewhat sick for a week, but she really wasn't that sick. And like you know, when Paisley gets sick, bro, she gets sick. And uh, she got the least sick she's ever been in her life when she had COVID. And so uh, this last week or two, I know six people uh, rather close to me that uh, all got COVID this week, okay? Uh, you, Lance, and then uh, four different people that I know through jiu-jitsu all got COVID this week. You and Lance, it was like you got hit by a truck. And uh, the four people I know here in Seattle, nothing. Nothing. In fact, uh, one of them was like, he didn't even know he had it. And for some reason, he goes, it was weird. Like, I just thought, I should test myself today. But he had no symptoms or, or anything. He just had this feeling, like, I should test myself. And he tested himself, and he was positive. And he couldn't believe it, because he didn't even have the runny nose, nothing. And uh, they all went through it like it was it was nothing. But meanwhile, you and Lance, I mean, holy smokes. Yeah. Poor Lance was like... Lance, well, the thing that Lance does is he sends me texts. And uh, it's either one or the other. It's either calling me an absolute idiot because it's something I said on an Observer radio show, or it's his step count. <laughs> These, this is our communication. <laughs> he's so, proud of that. You know, he's got he's always doing all this walking. And, man, he sent me the step <laughs> count from the last couple of days. It was like he had 340 steps a couple of days ago and uh, just can do nothing, just sitting around and, and just – he's feeling better today, but – Man, it, it's uh, no fun, man, especially for people who are active. You don't know what like, you're going to get is the point I'm making. Oh, well, absolutely. And I, look, I, that was, you know, during coming back from the showboat in January where they talked about, joked about the showboat strain because it seemed like so many people, you know, that weekend got it at a time where, again, things were up across the country the way it is now. It's just and I didn't catch it. At least I don't think I did. But eh, this time around, I did. You know, even with the double vax and the, the booster, I still ended up catching it. But. Talk about kids being resilient, Avery, both times, you know, he's vaccinated. So that absolutely, I'm sure, helps matters. But, you know, he was sick for one day both times and then completely fine. Yeah. So good on him because, again, <laughs> thank God for kids. They are resilient. All right, we're going to talk. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Sasha and, and Naomi right now. Do you have to? Well, uh, this I just have a point that I want to make here because. Oh, Jesus. Uh, you got you know, your thorns ready to put these, on your head? These Sasha fans, and oh. uh, it's a different kind of fandom with Maki Ito, but <laughs> the Sasha fans. They're both hard-headed? You know, we, Dave and I talked about this on Observer Radio last night, and we pointed out that, like, on the grand scale of things to be upset about booking-wise, like, you're one half of the tag team champions, and you and your partner are going to win a big number one contenders match, or your partner is, on Raw. And then both of you are going to be put in the singles title program. And both of you are going to challenge for championships on pay-per-view against Bianca Belair and Ronda Rousey. And in the end, you're going to, you're going to lose. But, you know, the idea that this is seen as some horrible, offensive, uh, walk out in the middle of a show. Bo- I mean, people are so mad at me and Dave. And if you look at the thread, I mean, some of the things that people are saying in defense of Sasha and and... Naomi, it's it's like it's insane. Well, it's can like, I try to have a rational conversation well, in with a second, you about this? I, I got a point I gotta make. And they're like, there has to be more. It makes no sense. There has to be more. We haven't heard their side of the story. There has to be more. They, this can't possibly be. And here we are, and it's Thursday, everybody, and there hasn't been more. There hasn't been more. I know it's hard to believe that their side of the story may in fact be exactly what happened, but I'm pretty sure that their side of the story is exactly what happened. And if you're this big a fan and you can't fathom that you're Sasha, she probably did. And that was her decision. And yeah, it it doesn't make... And I had people that were like, you know what? It's better they walked out in the middle of the show. Instead of actually doing the match and then walking out. And I'm like, so you're such a hardcore fan of this person that you're advocating them for them unprofessionally walking out in the middle of a... You're, that is your... Def- you're, I'm like, I don't get it, dude. 
They learn from Bruiser Brody, brother. <laughs> they the big fans of Bruiser Brody. Um, this has felt since the time that it happened that this is not about the creative per se, directly, 100%. And there is one side that, as of now, isn't really talking. We do know part of that side has got a contract coming up. We do know part of that side has had issues in the past with their creative and feels very confident in themselves in some kind of way about how they should be treated. I just feel like there's probably more than this than the creative and everything keeps coming back in the conversation to, well, you know, this is stupid, but it's by WWE standards. It's not that stupid that it just feels as though, and I could be dead wrong about this and, and we'll see, I have no real opinion on this until we, we find out more from it. This is like that Cody Rhodes leaving AEW situation. I'm sure there's a lot to unpack and it's going to have to unpack itself. And I'm not the person who can do it. And I'm not the person who can do it here. But I will wait and see what kind of happens here, because with all these factors at play, including how Sasha feels about herself and her character and how she may feel as though she could function outside of WWE, Naomi, who they have never given any credit to whatsoever. Remember, she was the third draft pick on Raw the last time around, and then she disappeared off TV for months. She had a, a, a feud with Sonya Deville that nobody could figure out why it was happening, except for something that we won't talk about, that, that seemed to be that's what the angle was. It's like, and she's towards the end. You know, again, maybe this has got more to do with leveraging contracts and not as much to do with creative. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Yes. When those contracts were negotiated the last time around, was Johnny Laurinaitis the person in charge of that? He was not, right? Because I, I he don't came know. on he came on last year. I don't know. Interest I just I would be interested to know uh if that has any I I, I know that like everyone's kinda of talking about this contract thing, but this is uh, this, like But but Brian, look, they're independent contractors. If you look, you can stand. They can stamp their feet, and they can. Was this professional? No, <laughs> no. You can say it's not. Um, do they have a reason to feel the kind of way that they do? I don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. Even with reputation aside, with Sasha, with Naomi. You know, people are already saying, well, this isn't, was Naomi uh, manipulated? Was she this? Was she? I, I don't know. Let's, we'll have to wait and hear from Naomi, you know, or well, Naomi's listen, representation. I can tell you this. And until that happens, I, you know, again, the way the contracts are, the way all of this is happening, I think a lot of attention is being put on the, the booking of how we're going to look out there in the ring, which, look, if you want to be like, there have been times, many, many times, where somebody has said the booking shouldn't matter, but then it actually affects their career trajectory. Now, I don't think that it's going to happen in this case, but, like, no one can act like when Sheamus ran away as a geek from whoever it was. Remember that when he was king, and then all of a sudden it was like, he should have never done that. And it's like, this is modern times WWE. This is this is actually really affecting him backstage. But for some people, it did. And it's like, it is such a dumb wacky place that i it is hard for me to stand firm on a judgment here on any of this stuff until more of it plays out dude these these uh oh they made the right call because it's bad booking <laughs> like i know you guys love sasha okay i know you love her all right she has not been badly booked in fact, she's been booked better than most of the women in WWE. Okay. Now, would it be Brian? And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Be, no, hold on. Is it fair to say maybe that she just doesn't want to work with Ronda Rousey? Right no, now? that has nothing to do with it. Okay. Th listen, the the idea here is that your women's tag team champions were going to be in contention for the singles championships, and a storyline literally leading to a pay per view where the story is you are you two are so good that you might walk out of this pay-per-view with every women's championship in this country. That what was be that's what was being offered here. Now, granted, they were going to lose, but, dude, you realize that as tag team champions, they feuded with Naomi and, uh, and Shayna, and they lost to build up to those matches, and they feuded with Rhea Ripley and, uh, and Liv Morgan, and they lost... Building up those matches. So don't even tell me, oh, well, they were going to 
oh, they were going to lose to Ronda Rousey and Bianca Miller. And that's, like, bad for their career. But doing random jobs on TV to Liv Morgan and Shayna Baszler and whatever to build up a random tag team match with a team, by the way, where the gimmick is one of them is dressed as a superhero and is wasting her career. That's literally the storyline they're telling. This, you're telling me, is much better for their careers than the storyline where they're trying to win every woman's belt in the company, leading to a pay-per-view, where you know there's no chance they're not having a good match with Bianca and Ronda Rousey. And yeah, they're going to lose in the end, but this is not a bad storyline. This is not horrible booking. This is not the culmination of years of horrible booking with Sasha Banks. She was upset about this. And uh, I could tell but you just this. I mentioned this. Does uh, this seem like a trigger point for other things? Hey, listen, she's had a does lot this of seem like a tr- if you now put on your psychologist cap for a minute. Does this seem like that would be a final breaking straw sort of situation? No, it doesn't seem like that at all. Or but did, apparently okay. it was. She's had a lot of issues over things for a so long there time. You go. And here's the deal. I talked about this Monday, and of course, you know, people got mad about it, and then they had to grasp it. Any anyone that said anything positive, oh, you got mad as about of people today, talking about you as of today on this show. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you could find a handful of people that are supporting Sasha Banks. And by the way, still nobody's talking about Naomi. It's all all of this is all about Sasha. Well, it's does that also say something too? But does my, that, my that's point is that's very interesting to there, me. There, there is, there is still. Almost no support for Sasha. Among management, I can almost say, I can't say 100%. I haven't talked to all of management or anything like that, but it's the same deal with management. Well, I think that would be a fair there thing is to no say. Support. She, she there is, is no thorn. support for her for management. So, like, there's there's nothing that has come out or changed or or anything like that. I mean, there's, there's actually uh, some stuff happening where I could just tell you management is very upset about this situation. And uh, they and didn't I, have I this energy more. for Tony Storm. No, they didn't. They didn't. They don't, and then and again, the the lack of anybody seemingly saying anything about Naomi. It's like, is that not to anger other family members? Is that because somebody uh, again? Th- that is interesting to me. Whereas the the response to Sasha from inside WWE. It was anybody surprised by that? <laughs> is anybody really surprised by that? That management would go, we we don't want to deal with Sasha Banks. I mean, you know. This person says, "Who cares one iota about support for management?" Well, would you ever like to see Sasha wrestle in WWE again? Because if you would, they then you probably, probably should be concerned though. about it's... the I, the management. Because like tells management's going to person... decide whether she ever comes back or not, or Something whether she's tells fired. Me this person will follow them, or whether as they freeze the contract. Mercedes Verano, wherever she goes. Which, by the way, is a pretty cool name. She does have that going for her. Who cares about what management thinks? That's the whole crux of the story, everybody. Whether you ever see her. <laughs> On WWE again is going to be based on what management decides. That's it. And she is under contract. And so if she walked out on her job, they can freeze her contract. So she can't just leave and go to stardom or AEW or whatever. Like, And that will also be in the hands of management. So, in fact, if you are a fan of Sasha Banks, yes, you should probably care very much about management's thoughts of this. Because she signed a contract. And thus, her career is in the hands of management. Do we all live in another fantasy world where that's not the case? Somebody make the cartoon of Brian doing the Vince, like, the the future of WCW is in my hands. The future of Sasha. Yes. Talk about some other stuff now. You guys Can I walk off this show now? Can I walk off my I'm ready to put my now? stuff down and walk off. Jesus. Everyone, oh no, you built this empire. You, you, you're going down with it first. Everybody, Mike. Yes. Everybody should everybody. hope. Should hope. Everybody to have fans like Sasha Banks has fans. I do. I wish. Nice. Wish I had a hive like that. Maybe now that the Adam and Mike Big Audio Nightmare has escaped from behind the paywall, I will get a hive the size of Sasha Banks. That's what I'm hoping for. Tony Storm says the original plan for her pie-throwing angle with Charlotte Flair was for her shirt to have been ripped off. 
Flair hit the 26-year-old with a pie during the November 26, 2021 edition of SmackDown. Storm appeared on the AW Unrestricted podcast released on Thursday and spoke about what was planned for the segment. I was actually quite happy with that segment that day because it was a lot better than the original idea. The original idea was I was called up and asked if I was comfortable with having my shirt ripped off or something. They wanted to do this whole angle where it was like they were going to rip my shirt off and I'd be embarrassed in my underwear. When you're asked if you're comfortable, if you're to do that, and it's like literally people are being fired every single week, It's like, well, yeah, I guess I'm comfortable with that. I guess I'm going to do that. Then a lot of people thought to not have that happen because that would have been terrible, a terrible idea. So to be honest, the pie was actually like it was quite a sweet treat in comparison to what it could have been. In hindsight, I don't really mind. I'm not even mad. People think I'm mad about it. I think it's actually hilarious. And uh, she commented on her time in stardom, said I didn't realize how much of my heart was still in stardom. I guess I always did realize it. But I never got over it. Spent so much time there, more than I realized, because my life moved so quickly that I... Yeah, it's funny. It's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But she walked out between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore? Well, I mean, she actually did the job in the championship match and then left. She didn't. She wasn't advertised for a championship match with Charlotte. And then 15 minutes into the show, walk out... And have them rewrite the. She didn't do that, you know. Well, you know what? I don't have much sympathy for him there. That's what they do on that show is they tear up the script while the show is going on, right? So they should be used to this. It should be old hat for them. And look at the job that they did. They, they didn't miss a beat on Monday night. NXT 2.0, 601,000 viewers, up 12.8% what? from last second. week's record low, 18 to 49, and 0.14, up 40%. You know the funny thing about this show, everybody? It was more than old people? So uh, last last week they did the uh, the show with all women's matches, all women's matches up and down the show, and uh, it did a record low rating. And so the week after they did a show with all women, women in every match. The female rating for the show this week cratered. NXT do it drew a a point two four. In males 18 to 49, which is the highest number the show has done since October. In women 18 to 49, it did a 0.05, the lowest the show has ever done. See, women hate women. It tied a record low with females 12 to 34. (laughs) Anyone who's ever dated knows this. So, uh, yeah, these women, (laughs) zero women, statistically, watched NXT 2.0 this week. (laughs) It's but so a lot of men watched it, is... and boy, did those men pop when she did that interview talking about how she was 18 and had not graduated high school yet. That's what happened. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We're going to do the Dynamite Report. But first, a shout-out here today. Loyal listener and friend Chris in Vegas. Works at Ruby Thomas Elementary School, and today was career day. Yes! Ruby Thomas Elementary School, Las Vegas, Nevada. The grade K-5 through classrooms got to hear from my lovely wife, Whitney, talking about Whale Scout. And from myself, I got to tell those youngsters about my career here as a radio show host and etc., and, man, I had a great time. A lot of wrestling fans in the class, actually. And uh, they talked about some of their favorite wrestlers. You'd never guess who some of their favorite wrestlers are. John Cena. I, I saw a lot of these. And uh, Rey Mysterio was mentioned, actually, by one of the teachers. She used to watch Rey Mysterio. But then, of course, she stopped watching wrestling in the 90s. And... Uh, and I don't think we had any mention whatsoever of anybody in modern-day uh, WWE or, or AEW. Just a lot of John Cena fans. But a bunch of great kids. Had some fun questions. I had a very enjoyable time. So I want to give a big shout-out to all the kids at Ruby Thomas Elementary School. Did, did it last cancel? year? I did it last year. I did it this year. And I'm going to do it again next year. Do you have a kid that, like, telecommutes there somehow? Or what, what's the, oh, what's the deal? Chris in Vegas' school. And I, I told them I was going down to Vegas for the show next week, and they wanted me to stop by the school. 
But they'll be out of school, so I Why can't stop Why are you by. both doing it? Is it one of those things where, like, you know, you're forcing him to pay you, but then what you say, you well, you can about? have Whitney on, and then it you can write it off? It was career day, or... and he asked us both to go and talk to the children. We didn't get any money for it. We just went and talked to the kids about careers. Why does there have to be an ulterior motive? Why does there have to be a conspiracy? That's the story of my life this last week. Why does everything have to be a conspiracy? Why can't it just be what it is? Sasha made an irrational decision and walked out, and I decided to do career day. That's the story of this week. All right, let's talk about this AEW show. So the opener was Samoa Joe beating the Joker, who was Johnny Elite, who is not Johnny Gargano, although uh, there was a uh, AEW social media post about Johnny Gargano, which in fact was not actually done by anybody working for AEW. It was a mistake. And so it is not any sort of clue about Johnny Gargano or anything like that. It was just, uh, you know, somebody in charge of a Twitter account sent out an unfortunate tweet. So uh, Samoa Joe beat him. Muscle Buster. Good match. Uh, Johnny Lee, uh, not under contract, I'm told. Hopefully he'll be back because uh, I like the guy. He's good. He's very talented. So hopefully we'll see more of him. Then we had an angle to set up... Uh, the big brawl, Sanjay, Jay Lethal, Satnam, my main man, Satnam Singh, best friends out there. That was good stuff. Hangman Page beat uh, Takeshita, and bro, this match was awesome. This match was so good, and uh, Hangman beat him with the GTS. Takeshita was so happy, he went and called his mom, said it was the best day he'd ever had in wrestling. And keep in mind, they, like, won the tag team titles from uh, from Kenny Omega and Kota Bushi. But this was the highlight of his career, he told his mother. And it was awesome. And then afterwards, Punk and uh, Page had a stare down, and, and Hangman Page stormed off. He's gotten to, is the storyline. He's gotten to. Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland beat J.D. Drake and Anthony Henry. Afterwards, they sent, set up a three-way for the pay-per-view. It is uh, Ricky Starks, Powerhouse Hobbs, Jurassic Express, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland, three-way for the tag titles. And they'll also be doing three-way singles match next week. Swerve versus Ricky Starks versus Jungle Boy. So that's next week. And Christian is the one that threw Jungle Boy into that match. MJF segment with Warlow. My God, this segment was awesome. This MJF, I don't know if it's just, you know, it's it's a lot of things. He is an awesome heel, but also all this stuff that gets out about him and, and WWE, they just get even more angry at him, and he's just nuclear heat in the building. And he comes out to give Wardlow the lashes, and first Wardlow laughs, and then he just doesn't even sell it. And, of course, this makes MJF just furious that he's not selling these lashes. So then... Uh, uh, the 10 guy, I always forget his name. He gives a lash or two and Sean and Spears, Sean Spears. And, and now Wardlow did sell the ninth one, but then he just, ah, one more. He says, so MJF boots him in the jingle jangle in case those kids at the school are listening. And he starts just whipping the heck out of him and, uh, lays him out with the diamond ring. Spears hits a C4 dude. This was such a great heavy heat angle, and the people are just living and dying with Wardlow. This was awesome. Owen Hart Cup Tournament quarterfinals. Kyle O'Reilly beat Ray of Phoenix with an arm bar to his bad dislocated arm. Uh, very, very good match. I, I kind of thought they might have a styles clash, but they didn't. It was a really good match, and Kyle O'Reilly goes to face Samoa Joe in the semifinals. We had a very long Jericho Regal face to face confrontation with all of the crew. And uh, to cut to the chase, uh, Jericho wanted Stadium Stampede. And uh, John Moxley, who I've mentioned this before, I mean, what you see is what you get with this guy. He ain't no gimmick. And he just grabs a mic. He goes, I ain't doing that. And so at the pay per view, he actually said more, but I can't say it on the air in case the children at the elementary school are listening. But uh, they're going to have a. Uh, a fight. They promise blood, bloodshed, violence. It's just going to be a big, violent brawl coming up at the pay-per-view. Blackpool Combat, Combat Club and the Jericho Appreciation Society. Yes, Maki Ito, everybody. Maki Ito was there with Britt Baker, and uh, they had a short, somewhat comedic match, but uh, stuff earlier in the show had gone long, 
And so it was very rushed. And the referee's like screaming at Britt to like, go do her, do that. So she puts on her hold, gets a submission. And uh, then we had a stare down with her and Tony Storm. So one difference between uh, WWE and AEW is that uh, if they if they need more time in WWE, they will cut a segment. But uh, they had a segment here with Serena Deeb and Dustin Rhodes, Tony Schiavone, and Thunder Rosa. And, bro, they were rushed for time, but they were not going to cut this segment. And when I watched the segment, with all due respect to everybody, you should have cut this segment. It wasn't a great segment. You can do this angle on any show. I know they wanted Serena Deeb to bury the way that management treats the women in WWE, but, like, you could have done that Friday. You could have done that next Wednesday. You could do that from now until the end of time. But they had to get it on TV, and as a result, the main event got about six minutes. Adam Cole and Jeff Hardy, and it was just like boom, 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 boom. Jump them at the bell. Go, 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 go. And uh, Adam Cole hits the boom after Jeff Hardy missed the, misses the senton. And then they still had to do an angle afterwards. So they're rushing this angle. The Young Bucks are out there. Uh, they attack the Hardy. Sting and Darby come out. Red Dragon takes them out. They kill poor Darby with a high-low on the ramp. O'Reilly pilmanizes uh, Sting's ankle with a steel chair. So I'm not sure where all of this is going, but they had to get these angles in. And so I guess we'll find out. They got uh, Rampage on Friday. And they got uh, Dynamite next week to finish the card for this pay-per-view. So I thought it was a good show. I didn't think it was a great show. Uh, I can have Fauntleroy do the spoilers for uh, Rampage. Not the spoilers, the lineup for Rampage uh, after the break. But I do want to mention here, okay, Brian Danielson. You probably saw the video if you go on social media. So they were doing a melee on Rampage. And Brian Danielson is like Rumpelstiltskin. His leg goes through the between the ramp and the ring apron, and he's stuck. And literally, like, the report's live where it took five to ten minutes to get him out. And then, uh, you know, I, I had other people that, that say it was only about five. There's no way it was ten minutes. And then I talked to other people that were there, and it was like, there's no way it was five. He was down there forever. So everyone was all worried that he was hurt and everything like that. And uh, and this is what I can tell you, okay? What's so funny? What, what is what is what is Brian Danielson getting his leg caught between the ring? What does that have to do with Rumpelstiltskin? You don't remember the story of Rumpelstiltskin? He spun straw. No, but the story into gold. the story of Rumpelstiltskin is like you had to, you had someone had to figure out his name, and so at the end of the story. You probably never read this version, of Avery. You probably read the PG version, but in the actual version, there and was an X version. Uh, yeah, hopefully the 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 children at uh, 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 Ruby Thomas Elementary School are not listening. But he gets really mad when they figure out his name, and he starts stomping on the ground, and he stomps a hole in the ground, and his leg goes through the hole, and it tears him in two. You didn't know that? No. Yes. No, that's the end of Rumpelstiltskin. He got torn in half when he stomped a hole in the ground. But can I get to the point? Yes! Apparently a lot of people knew about the, the tearing in half of Rumpelstiltskin. And so when uh, Daniel Bryan got his foot caught, they maybe they thought he got torn in half. But he didn't. He's fine, okay? Now, this is what I was told. This was not planned okay when they went over the the whole thing before the show <laughs> you don't say it was not planned for brian <laughs> danielson tear him in half okay but here's the point he didn't really fall in and get stuck okay i was pretty much told that he just decided that he was going to do this and so <laughs> all of a sudden he'd become dick murdoch i don't know he pretended like he <laughs> fell through and got stuck and then he pretended that he couldn't get out for like 10 minutes I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Because he's pro wrestling. If that's true, because he's pro wrestling. The you know, same way Dick Murdoch would do that for no damn reason other than he could. That's why Brian Danielson can do it. I haven't talked to the guy. Okay. <laughs> All right. But we got to think about Brian Danielson. This is a guy who, when it was his, you know, they decided, okay, well, what do you want to, what do you want to be called? Because you're not going to be Brian Danielson in WWE. And one of his names he came up with was Buddy Peacock. Because I guess he figured he could get it over. 
And there's been a million things in his career that he's decided, I think I can get this over. I think I can get over the small package. I mean, there's there's plenty of them. <laughs> Drew Gulak. So I guess, and I listen, I don't know all the details, okay? I just know I asked some people last night, and, you know, uh, a lot of them were like, well, anyway, I think he just decided, well, I, I'm, we're going to do this brawl, and I'm going to pretend that I fell between the ring and the ramp and got stuck. I'm going to pretend I can't get out. And I mean, it was all over the internet. I mean, there were there were people, there were fans super worried about it and everything like that. But um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, listen, I don't know all the details, everybody. But what I can tell you is that uh, he was playing it up. That I can tell you a hundred percent. And he's not hurt, okay. And I was strongly given the impression that he just decided, you know, the the whole thing from start to finish. I guess it could come out later that he actually did kind of fall through it and then decided he was going to make a big deal out of it. But one way or the other, him not getting out for 10 minutes, that was all him. He just decided it would be whatever. And so that's what he did. So he's not hurt. You know, it's not. That's just what happened. Bro, I don't get it either. Slip I mean, and bust your ass. You just lay there for an extended period of time just to to oversell it. I don't know I if all of it. this is going to even air on Rampage, everybody. You may not see any of this on Rampage. You know, they may have just no. started the brawl and then they go to break and they come back. Because trust me, there's not you're not going to watch him sitting there for ten minutes in a hole. Okay. I'm sure, it wasn't it's, ten minutes. It's a one hour show. Oh, I was I was pretty much told he was in there a long time. Like it may have been ten minutes. Well, may have felt like it. No, no, because I said to someone, I go, I, I, I said, I heard it was 10 minutes, but someone else said five. And they were like, no, he was in there for a long time. Anyway, back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live, the returning uh, Mike Sempervivi. To all of the children still listening to this show, if any of you are, I got news for you, kids. Oh, boy. John Cena says he hopes to be back in WWE soon. He spoke with Adam's Apple recently regarding a potential return and also by the upcoming 20th anniversary of his WWE television debut. You know, sometimes they say things like, man, you know, your kids, they just grow up so fast. In the blink of an eye, they're they're old. And sometimes I look at Paisley and I'm like, God, she's already six. Like, she's going to be in first grade and seven next. That's like, eh, how, what? But then you think about John Cena's only been around 20 years. It seems like 40 or more. Anyway, he says, I know in WWE years, I turned 20 pretty soon, so that's a pretty big thing. And from a pretty storied class of folks, Batista, Randy Orton, Lesnar, kind of all turned 20 this year. I'm aware that that's coming around the corner, and who knows? There's a lot of cool stuff going on. I don't want to say no to these opportunities that are on my doorstep, so I don't know when I'll be back, but hopefully it's soon. I've been gone for too long. He'll be back soon, everybody. Soon you will be able to see John Cena on your television scene. I need big match John Cena in the G1. Come on, John. Let's do it. G1. Let's go. Please. Come on. That actually, I would I would watch every awesome. G1 match if John awesome. Cena were in the G1. By the way, G1 schedule was, uh, was announced. But we'll have to tell you about it later. Because we are out of time. But I'll be back tonight. We got a very special edition of the Brian and Vinny show because it is a Brian and Vinny and Lisa guest host show tonight. She'll actually be going to uh, the show in Vegas next week. So we'll talk about Dynamite. And yes, I guess she's going to talk about NXT 2.0 as well. If she watched it, she may have been the only woman on the planet that watched it. Anyway. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.